Welcome everyone to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University and to our very first forum of the fall 2011 season. I'm Jennifer Bernardi, the Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum, where the speaker and the audience get to exercise their freedom of speech. Thank you for joining us tonight at The Real Paper, Journalism Then and Now. The forum is very excited to host this Real Paper reunion and we encourage you to look around the audience at the familiar faces that you haven't seen in a while. Tonight we'll be discussing what was inspiring and enlightening about this free counterculture paper and why it eventually folded. We'll also talk about what direction our experts think journalism as a means of communication and as a business is heading in the 21st century. Let's get started, but first I would like to thank the Ford Hall Forum's generous sponsors, uh, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Barr Foundation, the Nellie May Education Foundation, and our partners at Suffolk University, which serves as the, as the forum's home base. We especially thank our season sponsor, the Boston Beer Company, makers of Samuel Adams Beer. Finally, the Ford Hall Forum very much thanks our members whose generosity makes this free public event possible. You too can become a member. Just go over to that info uh, table right after the program. I am very pleased to introduce our moderator for today's discussion. Monica Collins, who is a vice president on the board of the Ford Hall Forum. The real paper where she worked from 1975 to 1979 set Monica Collins off on a career that took her to the Boston Herald, to USA Today, and back to the Boston Herald with side trips at TV Guide, the Boston Globe, and various other publications. Today, Collins writes a syndicated column and works as a communication consultant to nonprofits. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Monica Collins. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for assembling this panel. Um, all I had to do was give you a suggestion. You were off. <laughs> so it's happening. Oh my goodness, I am blinded by the light of this panel. I really am. Um, I am very flattered and thrilled. I mean, when I was at The Real Paper, I was, you know, kind of the, I wouldn't say I was the lowliest of the low, but I was on a low rung there at The Real Paper. And I, <laughs> I was just starting out. Okay, I, I, but I am very flattered and thrilled to be in the company of such greatness and speaking to all of you about The Real Paper. First, I'm going to introduce, introduce our panelists, and uh, then we, we, how we will proceed is I will ask a question of each panelist, and they will answer. <laughs> we know that. And then we will probably have more of a free-for-all uh, discussion as the evening progresses, but in the beginning, we're going to try to keep it a little organized anyway. Harper Barnes. Harper Barnes when I came to The Real Paper, had already left The Real Paper, but he was a legend at The Real Paper. He is a longtime editor and cultural critic for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He has written for Rolling Stone and The Washington Post. He is the author of the novel Blue Monday and Standing on a Volcano, The Life and Times of David Rowland Francis, a biography of Woodrow Wilson's ambassador to Russia. Jan Harper's on my left. Jan Freeman, on my right, uh, since 1997, Jan Freeman has been writing for the Boston Sunday Globe's weekly language column, The Word. She worked as an editor at The Real Paper, Boston and Inc. magazines, and the Boston Globe, where she was a science news editor until she launched her weekly column on English usage. She is the co-author of Ambro Bierce's Write It Right, the celebrated cynic's language peeves deciphered, appraised, and annotated for 21st century readers. <laughs> <sighs> so she thought when she finished it. <laughs> Laura Shapiro. Laura Shapiro, when she would come into the real paper, she would sit near, near my, me, and she had an aura of, an aura of respect. <laughs> you had a, you, really, Laura? You, you currently are a columnist for gourmet.com, Gourmet Magazine's website. Formerly, you worked uh, for the Real Paper. And for 16 years as a writer for Newsweek, 
Laura covered food, women's issues, and arts, and won several journalism awards for her work. Her work has also appeared in the New York Times, Condé Nast Traveler, Gourmet, Granta, The American Scholar, Gastronomica, Slate, and many other publications. Her first book was Perfection Salad, Women and Cooking at the Turn of the Century. She is also the author of Something from the Oven, Reinventing Dinner for 1950s America, and Julia Child. Paul Salmon, two away from me on the right of Jan Freeman. Paul Salmon, since 1985, has been a business and economics correspondent for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer on PBS, a business reporter for GBH in Boston since 1977. Salmon was the co-originator and executive editor of PBS's business documentary series, Enterprise. Salman was also the founding editor of The Real Paper, as well as the East Coast editor of Mother Jones Magazine. He began his career in business journalism as a Neiman Fellow at the Harvard Business School in 1976. His reporting has won him several Emmys and two Peabody Awards. Mark Zanger, Behind the Mask. Since 2007, Mark Zanger has worked as the Director of Communications for the Coalition of Families for the retarded. As a seasoned journalist, Zanger has worked as a freelance writer and restaurant critic for the Boston Phoenix since 1981. Zanger has published five books, mostly of which are related to his work as a restaurant critic. He has previously served as chief editor of DelphiForums.com, op-ed editor of Metro West News, and public information officer for Oxfam America, Inc. Before he served as editor-in-chief of the real paper from 1975 through 1980, Zanger went to Yale. This is the part I added. With cartoonist Gary Trudeau, he is the model for Zonker in Dean's Bear. Sorry. Mark. He's the model for Mark. He's the model for Mark, exactly. And that's not the only thing he does. Okay. <laughs> well, you'll correct me. Um, first of all, before we begin, I would like to um, I would like to dedicate this forum to the memory of Kathy McCarthy, Arthur Friedman, and all Real Paper alums who have passed on. As a generation, we believed only the good died young. Friedman is remembered for his stiletto-sharp writing, his keen Shakespearean knowledge, and his rubber stamp. Thanks, but save it for your shrink. <laughs> yes, I guess a lot of this stuff we will have to save for our shrinks. Mm -hmm. Thus, tonight, we'll offer an overview of the neurotic brilliance of it all. Basically, the real paper was an incredible incubator of talent. Here's just a smattering of the alums and a smidge of their achievements. And really, it's just a smidge of the achievements. Betsy Meyer went on to be a producer at Channel 2. Susan Sloan went on to be a producer at Channel 5. Ron Campisi's distinctive design saved many a publication. Really, it's only a smidge. Um, I James Isaacs wrote about clubs and records. He's a music historian whose NPR commentaries and liner notes on great jazz records shine brightly. Ed Zuckerman wrote for the paper. He became a TV writer and producer for Law and Order with various series and TV movies to his credit. Joe Klein wrote about politics. He went on to Newsweek and the famed anonymous author of Primary Colors. He's a persistent Sunday morning pundit. Joe Connison, political writer for Salon, is now political writer for Salon and the New York Observer. Rory O'Connor, writer, editor, invest, is an investigative reporter, global TV producer, and blogger of Media as a Plural at roryoconnor.org. David Anson replaced Stuart Byron, the first film critic at the Real Paper. Anson went on to become the longtime movie critic of Newsweek. David Thompson, Jerry Perry, Pat McGilligan, David Rosenbaum followed Anson. In turn, they went on to write books and movies. Rosenbaum, in fact, became the editor of the paper. Photographer Peter Southwick became a photo editor AP in the Globe. Lucy Bartholomew, editorial artist, became the longtime designer of the Globe. Lynn Staley, longtime designer at Newsweek. 
Jenny Scott, freelance political writer, is the New York Times reporter, credited with coming up with the idea of prize-winning series after 9-11. She recently wrote a book, Singular Woman, about Barack Obama's mother. When I helped Mark Sanger edit a weekly section called The Real Almanac, I hired Judith Barrett, who's now a renowned author and cookbook writer. I took on Stephen Reichlin, who is a grilling guru now, with specials airing all the time on public TV. Helen Reese, former promotions manager, is on the Ford Hall Forum board and a prominent literary agent. Bob Rotner, the real publisher of The Real Paper, went on to work at Harvard and is now an education executive. Lynn and Bob Williams, ace salespeople, eventually married, and I heard they went into the real estate business. <laughs> ah, the couples. One of the most famous pairs shares the stage with me, Paul Salmon and Jan Freeman. And there were others, Lynn and Marty, Rory and Muffin, and many others. Those were the days, my friend. Office romances were not frowned upon. The, cr the, the crushes and the hookups were as intense as the times. David Rockefeller, an investor and part of the group that bought the real paper, called in yesterday from California to wish us well and tell Jen Bernardi at the Fort Hall Forum office that his experience at the paper was a shining highlight of his professional life. And this is from a Rockefeller. Imagine what it was like for the rest of us. I guess that's, that explains why we're all here tonight. During a time in history when you didn't need a weatherman to tell which way the wind was blowing, we were part of a weekly paper with our fingers in the wind. The real paper represents so much more than just another job. Harper Barnes, you were present at the creation. You were the editor of the old Cambridge Phoenix and notoriously got fired, an event that gave birth to the real paper. Give us a brief history of the birth of the real paper from your perspective. Uh, well, I actually I asked, uh, had lunch with Paul Solomon today and I asked him to tell me what had happened. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little vague on, on some of it. Uh, see how well you do. For the usual reasons, uh, considering the era. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I uh, I was the editor of the, the of what was called actually called the Phoenix. There were at the time two papers, the Phoenix in Boston after dark, uh, from seventy to seventy two, um, and I was just enough of a hippie that uh, the articles in the paper, some of the articles in the paper had a certain antic quality, and the man who owned the paper who understandably uh, decided it was his paper, not my paper. And uh, I think he wanted the paper to be more serious and uh, to be more, I, I, I was told, to, more, to be more like the New Republic. And he fired me, which is, I now realize, his right. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, it seemed like an outrage. <laughs> Jan uh, got got together and, and went on strike. I, the, the thing I think I'm proudest of is that uh, Howard Darsh, uh, who is in the audience here, who seems to have gotten gray like me, uh, <laughs> Howard Darsh, at, who was the comptroller, uh, went on strike with us. And I, you don't see that. <laughs> <in my opinion. laughs> uh, and Russell Turgeman, who was here, who was the and, circulation director. And Russell Turgeman, the circulation of, uh, director. And um, so they went on strike. To the, to, I got rehired. Uh, I got fired again. The Boston Globe used to keep this picture of me. And they'd run it on like page three every, every so often. And they'd have the headline, Fired Again. <laughs> <laughs> they used to flop it, you know, so I was looking. And so, so, it appeared that they had taken two pictures. <laughs> One picture and, and, and finally, uh, I got the message, and I agreed to step down. Uh, and Paul reminds me that Carol Iran, who, who is not with us, who, who is with us, <laughs> 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 present, 
uh, became the editor, and I uh, I went went on a, I, I drove across the country. And, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, after a while, Richard realized that uh, it was almost as if I was still there. <laughs> so he sold the paper to Stephen Van who at that point changed the name of Boston After Dark to the Boston Phoenix, at which point, led by Paul, we uh, started the real paper. That's the origin of the real paper. And the name, the real paper? Well, uh, initially, we wanted to call it the real Phoenix, I believe. Yes. And legal authorities, <laughs> as I recall, we were advised that uh, right. that was unwise. But so then a guy named Chuck Faker, who wrote for the paper, at a uh, press conference where we were announcing that we were continuing on, despite the fact that the paper had been sold out from under us, uh, they asked us what the name of the paper was, and nobody knew, and Chuck said, the real paper. That was it. <laughs> Paul Salman, you became the first editor of the real paper, right. uh, founding editor of the real paper. You also worked with the inestimable Tom Friedman, who put the first... I think he's estimable. <laughs> oh, I think he's inestimable <laughs> at that time. Well, we have a very high estimate. <laughs> no, very high. <laughs> I do remember this day, the first headline on the first story I ever wrote for the real paper. It was not a big thing. It was about Amish clothing for sale in Cambridge. And the thing about Amish clothing is it didn't have buttons. And uh, I turned in the story, Tom edited it, and the headline he put on it was, A Mish is as good as a mile. <laughs> <laughs> the first headline on my first, <laughs> first story. <laughs> Paul Salmon, you became the first editor of the real paper. You worked with Tom Friedman, who's a wonderful managing editor. Speak about the freedom of writing and editing in that early paper. Were there any restrictions? <laughs> there was only one, which uh, the two people at the on the uh, panel uh, actually affected. Now, but I'm going to have to because Jan and I were trying to remember the details of this particular event. But Laura, I'm sure you can remember them. It was it was. Uh, no, I asked you. I don't. I don't remember the details. Right? So. Well, you were the editor. Tell me. Tell they me told me it was a story by by George Fraser. It was a uh, Boston columnist, some of you may remember, who yeah. wrote a, a Literary Life was the name of this column, wrote it, I think, twice a week, and it was, he kept using the word duenda, if anybody uh, remembers or knows what that means, and for this day, I don't think I do. Uh, but he was, he was a very um, au courant uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> you're give me a hard time, I haven't even finished the sentence yet. Uh, he was, he, he fashioned himself, fancied himself, uh, au courant and uh, very stylish. That was his thing. And so he, I got him to write an article for the paper. It, I think it was about Bette Midler. Is that for, incorrect? Do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? Even? No, this, this whole thing is a blur. <laughs> at, at, any, at any rate, uh, he, used, he used the word uh, in, in the copy. He used the word that is spelled C-U-N-T. Um, it just all by, by the by. I mean, it wasn't, you know, a particularly uh, heat moment in this article. It just, yeah. <laughs> and that was fine. Um, so we were in the basement, uh, which was our home for the first couple of years, in Central Square in Cambridge. And the two of them came to me uh, and said, you can't publish this. We can't publish this. Uh, so, well, what do you mean? I, George Frazier, this is a coup to get you know, the famous George Frazier to write for this you know, uh, weekly newspaper. Um, he said, well, you, you just can't. It's sexist. It's, uh, in it, you just can't do it. No, no, I, how am I going to say, what am I going to tell George Frazier? They said, well, we don't care what you're going to tell George Frazier. You're not publishing it. Now, remember, or maybe we should introduce at this point, the fact that this was a cooperatively owned 
paper, if you were a full-time employee, regardless of what you did at the paper, you had a full share. And if you were half-time, part-time, like the cartoonist, some of you may remember David Omar White, he, he had a half share. Uh, and that you could vote that much if there were a you know, meeting of the shareholders, you could decide and the votes would be taken on the basis of that. So it wasn't as if I had mm, enormous power uh, in the organization. I couldn't just do what I want. I certainly couldn't tell two people who I had enormous uh, respect for on top of everything else, and who are ferocious people, by the way. <laughs> but just, you wouldn't want to tangle with them either. Uh, and so I said, well, we didn't publish the word, did we? No. <laughs> there you go. QED. Uh, so that that's the only thing. We no, we published we published almost anything else. The only things I can think of, they were all off color, but uh, was I remember this, I don't know how to actually tell this story because this this also the only other thing that I think that ever didn't get in was when Stuart Byron and I wrote a uh, that got in. That's shocking. <laughs> Let us in on it. Let us in on it. Let us in on it, Paul. What was it? No, I'm, I'm not going to say all of these things myself. <laughs> you have to. You have to say this one. I, did we really? We had a, a little, uh, a, not even a column, it was a little, a little uh, box in the, on the back page or somewhere at the end of the paper that was called the special of the week. It could be anything. It could be a, a, a restaurant. It could be a, a little yeah. sort of park that you had discovered that was a nice place to be contemplative. Stuart Byron wanted to have a special of, of the week be an activity that he called fist fucking. Oh. And there was a lot of talk. He, he, was, he was gay. He was gay. <laughs> and, he, and we were unbelievably open-minded. <laughs> Some of us still are. <laughs> Did he get it in there? Well, that she, she thinks yes. Jan says no. no. Jan remembers. So what did we do? As I recall, the reason he thought he could insist on this was that one week in desperation, there were no new little restaurants around. <laughs> and nothing we could think of. You can we, see the relationship between the two. <laughs> we, we actually did make a special of the week sex and illustrated it with a discreet but unmistakably heterosexual, you know, heteronormative, <laughs> we would say now, picture, with just charming little piece of copy by John Lipsky, another wonderful colleague whom we've lost recently. And he just wrote an adorable little piece about how sex was good for communication between the generations, it didn't hurt the environment. <laughs> there were so many things to recommend in a special of the week. Yeah. And I think you know that's... What happened if you had printed that well, we, there's some discussion, some argument as to whether we did or not. I don't know. I don't think anything would have happened. No. Not like George Collins said the first of the same speech. I mean, we've gotten fined. This is a real paper. We didn't, I mean, no. if you don't want it, you don't want to buy it. This is not broadcast. That's that's all FCC. No, no. It was, this is you know like hustler. I mean, there's way more prurient stuff out there than us. Seventy-four, maybe. It was seventy-four. It was before I got there. It was set. Yeah, it's two words. I haven't remembered it. Seventy-four. Um, also, uh, well, let's let's uh, be a little distinguished right now. Laura Shapiro. Of the many distinctive pieces you wrote for the real, p the real, p there was a woman's column with a determined but not strident voice. <laughs> you were not in the tradition of Jill Johnston, the radical lesbian feminist who wrote for the Village Voice. Your column was more forgiving of men, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Speak about your audience at that time, and could a woman's Column exist in these postmodern times, but speak about your column and relate it to today. Oh well, that's a good question, actually. If we could, uh, if you could get away with something like that, because we don't have forums like the Real Paper anymore. But at that time, we had uh, we had a, a 
early on there was a black writer at the paper who wrote a column called The Black Notes. And uh, as the women's movement started to pick up, I thought, black notes, we should have women's notes. So I harangued Harper for quite a while and uh, he finally <laughs> gave in and let me do this column. And, uh, and it was great, it was the, the most fun you can imagine having. Uh, it was the dawn of the women's movement around here. There were a lot of stirrings of it, obviously, in the 60s, but, but here things were just Picking up in 1970 and the, the great uh, the Women's March that we had on August 26th, it's, everything kind of coalesced then and there was lots going on. And I just went around writing about it. And because of the nature of the real paper, you just did what you want and, uh, and said what you want. This was one of the big shocks when I got to Newsweek and I realized things, <laughs> things were different. They kept saying, you have to put in the other side. <laughs> never <heard> <laughs> side, I would be, if it was right, I would be saying it. <laughs> that, that never came up at the real papers. <laughs> so we, we just did it, and uh, and I got, I got great mail. Um, there just, there were not that many voices out there that were really speaking to these, to these issues that were coming up, abortion and birth control and men, and believe me, men were a big problem, and uh, <laughs> I had no intention of being forgiving. I, I thought you were, Laura. I thought you were. You, you, uh, I thought you were. I remember when you referred to a boyfriend who then became a husband, and I was like, yay, she <laughs> You were forgiving to that extent. <laughs> That's what she means by forgiving. Forgive him. <laughs> But the, the, but the letters the letters were great, and the, and the fact that you'd go to something and um, and people sort of looked to the real paper to, to keep this stuff out there. It was a time when women were doing a lot of things and the straight press was, there was just no way they could write about it without putting it down, getting it wrong, condescending. Uh, to, it was just, it was just, um, it was the thing that, that the press has been trying to do about women's rights since about the middle of the 19th century, and that is, a, uh, report it wrong, and B, say it was over. According to the press, the women's movement ended in about 1872. <laughs> so people looked to the real paper to see that, uh, that this stuff was acknowledged and it was out there. And a lot of people hated what I was saying. Of course, the women's movement was splintered in many different ways, so if I landed on one side of a splinter, then I heard from the other people, but it was fine, it was fine. I had a I had a great time doing it, and, and the hate mail, even the hate mail was good. We did tons about abortion. Abortion was, was a cause that I felt very, very strongly about, and I wrote about it endlessly, constantly. One great thing about the real paper was that you could beat a dead horse as long as you wanted. <laughs> Just keep at it, it was fine. So I kept that abortion, and I would get letters. Uh, Boston, of course, is full of many people who, then and now, who deeply opposed to abortion, and they would write to me and tell me I should have been aborted. And that's why I, I kept all those letters and stuff. So um, it was great. And you could never do it today in a, in a paper that had a kind of general reach. You can do it in the, everything is safe. You could be a blogger. Yes, you could be a blogger, and so other people. You could do it on Facebook with your friends. Yeah, that just the people who agree with you would, would see it, but to, but to write, we were a very general interest publication. <laughs> <laughs> and so to, when I think of the, you know, the vast numbers of, of uh, you know, old people and Republicans who were reading it. <laughs> um, anyway, so it was a time, it's, it was over, but it was great. <laughs> Thank you. Jan Freeman, you were the style queen at the real paper, which you have already told us that you kept something. You, you maintain standards. How did you create the style for the paper's prose and stick to it? There were, you had a stable of gonzo writers. Everybody was flexing their muscles to write. How then did you copy edit that? How then did you create a standard for a paper that was on the edge? I don't actually think much of that was my problem at all. I would say that I don't want this to sound like kids today, they can't write anymore. But 
the people we had writing for us regularly were, most of them, truly excellent. The regular stable, the rock writers, the music writers, Laura, yeah. lots of clean copy everywhere. I mean, those people were committed to clean copy. Now, there were also huge political pieces that needed to be cut and pasted and redone, and we ended up with some messy stuff in them. But it's not as if there was any discussion of, um, you know, how sty our house style being like times of the globe. Nobody cared. All we had to do was be more or less consistent. I mean, we were busy writing wonderfully long headlines, because we had room to. And you know, putting shark's teeth in Richard Dixon's face. <laughs> and um, the prose was just not a problem. Uh, it's, it, it was a, a stellar group. And in fact, I was green enough at the time not to appreciate how lucky I was. This was only when I started editing different prose at different larger places that I realized that the median was really not quite as high <laughs> as I had been led to believe. So thanks, everyone, from the real paper for <laughs> making it easy. It was, this was true, by the way, of, of people who weren't even writers for the real paper who wrote uh, either at the time or subsequently. Russell Perkins, who's here, I remember one day walking by a typewriter. Obviously, uh, that was the era. And there was this little funny squib that somebody had written. I had no idea who had written it. <clears throat> and I read this thing. I said, who wrote this? This is fabulous. And it turned out to be Russell. What was it about, Russell? It was about what happened to the Campbell soup girls through their sexual <laughs> escapades at military installations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think everybody heard that. Perhaps it's just as well. You had the advantage. What? I just it was the Campbell soup kids. That's right. It was Campbell, uh, uh, Brenda Bendover and Gene the Machine, if I recall. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was this. Hey, sing us up on the panel. I just <laughs> no, you're not, to, Russell. Well, you can't. You gave everybody a chance. I mean, anybody that had any talent in any possible realm was given an opportunity to express that, and that dynamism really propelled the paper forward. They were, it, they, they were no internal class distinctions at the beginning. Well, and, and, <laughs> and, for, and for, for a while. And David Chandler, who's here also, I just want to say. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, who, who was, was a layout editor. editor. He was a layout editor, a yes. design director, and, yes. and went on to a career at the Boston Globe, wrote the book Life on Mars, wrote a piece for, Atlant for the Atlantic Monthly. I mean, and the, and the copy I can attest to what Jan said, the copy was just pristine. Even if he does type with two fingers. <laughs> One. 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 Sorry. One. But, but I mean, Laura, Mark, Harper, just absolutely perfect copy. I mean, yeah. Just perfect. Mark Sanger, <laughs> where do I begin? Well, you're going to criticize me no matter where I begin. So I'll begin. <laughs> with The Red Chef. The foodie column you wrote before there were foodie columns. Or do I start with the restaurant critic character you created, please notice I do not speak his name, who endures to this day. You created the enlightened, politicized restaurant review way before Anthony Bourdain came on the scene. Also, your investigative reporting about the arsonist of Symphony Road Expose corruption at the city's core. Speak about your bifurcation. <laughs> well suited to speak about it. Um, from style to substance that the real paper allowed you. Okay. <laughs> but first of all, we have to kind of go back and capture the atmosphere of that time a little bit. So let me begin by saying that while all those foundations that gave the Ford Hall Forum all this money to have us do this, they really should give that money to poor people. No, you see there's no response to that, but in 19, you know, 71, two, three, four, five, that would have been a laugh line, that would have been big. They should make us pay to do this, they, you know. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, there's a much more wonderful story about the name that was often told by the late Arthur Friedman, since he was the hero of it. Um, <laughs> Arthur's story is that there was a vote of the collective. I was not present. I worked for the bad guys at that time, Boston After Dark Brigade, the Boston Phoenix. We were so ashamed we took out an ad in the real paper to express our solidarity. <laughs> um, um, 
So Arthur's story is that the collective took a vote. Yeah, there were two nominees, the real paper and the real thing. And the real thing actually won, but since Arthur was counting the votes, he rigged it for the real paper because he knew that was better. <laughs> now, you know, nine years later, I'm explaining to people why it has that name. I, I finally got bored and just started saying, it's real paper, it's not plastic or metal. Come on, leave it alone. So, it, uh, corrections, Monica. One, I no longer work for the Coalition of uh, Families and Advocates, which dropped the R word uh, on a rare case of their uh, taking my valuable PR advice. Just give it to me, Mark. So. Yeah, well, we gave you crap like that. Me problem. <laughs> so, you know, now I actually work in mobile crisis intervention and mental health. I'm a paraprofessional social worker. Most of what I write is medically protected from any of you ever reading it. Uh, <laughs> Ten people read it. So the freedom that we had, <laughs> since we had failed to go back to the atmosphere, was it was a the freedom of desperation. It didn't matter as long as we filled it up, people would buy it, and the freedom of the times, uh, which involved among other things blurring all the lines between audience and, and performers. And it, it certainly this evening, you know, there are many people in the audience who know more than I do, and I did anticipated that difficulty. Um, I'm wearing this stupid outfit because I'm Robert Nato's body double. I go to restaurants <laughs> and well, you know, I don't I use other names to make reservations. Uh, my picture really should not appear on the internet since it would make my job more difficult and it's the last writing of job I've got and I hate to lose it. Um, yeah, I had a lot of freedom as a writer, although you know there would be strange constraints. Um, when I got there, when I started writing through the real paper, um, I was not an owner, and I was working for a collective organization. And this was, you know, much better than being a Palestinian uh, guest worker on an Israeli kibbutz, but structurally <laughs> similar. <laughs> in that, you know, the owners and managers ran the paper, and the, uh, many of the columnists were not owners by then. This was kind of midway of the run. And, um, so we actually had to organize the Real Paper Columnists Guild <laughs> and negotiate for some trivial thing. I mean, we were, we were paid in the mid two figures. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the highest, the highest pay at the paper was $175, and that was the a week. Yeah. You better not tell me who that was. That could be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> me, and, me and Rotner, oh. and, uh, and 110 was lowest full-time uh, pay. I started at 100 as a freelance. But that's after the, that's yeah. after the cooperative. Right. Yeah, well, no, it was before the sale, right before the sale. Oh. I think I went out and got food poisoning for about 50 bucks, maybe yeah, 60. No, 50, 50 is what counts, yeah. 50 dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Did they reimburse you for your restaurant? Yes. And you could go wherever you wanted? Yeah. No one. And spend as much as you wanted? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the controller. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I think I could, actually, because my taste ran to, this was, you know, what I had that was different. My taste ran to little ethnic holes in the wall anyway. So, I, you know, I kind of didn't review the big expensive places. Uh, Bob the Chef. Like, and I still don't like them. Bob the Chef. I remember you did Bob the Chef. Uh, Bob the Chef. I did every little Chinese restaurant in 20 miles around. Um, <laughs> and it was wonderful sexual food in those days. Um, and you could do things, but you know, things would happen to you. Like when I started writing uh, short takes, when I actually went on staff after the paper had been sold, uh, the first or second or third week, uh, Marty Linsky, the editor, decided that Laura Shapiro should, you know, kind of be my editor, and so Lord, you know, right on deadline, decided to teach me how to write. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, they were worse people, but it was not a great time. And I was uh, <laughs> a very young person, and um, it, its arrangement did not last. <laughs> I just, I interrupt briefly to say the only person who didn't come with us, who didn't stay with us at the real paper, but moved to the other paper, that is to say, Boston After Dark, was George Kimball, the who yeah. also late, uh, the late George Kimball, a sports writer here for, for many years. And he explained to me, when he explained apologetically that he was leaving the collective to go to the other side, 
he explained that the reason he couldn't stay with the paper was that Laura Shapiro was going to edit him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he simply couldn't stand it. <laughs> Mark, I want to get to the, the investigation you did of Symphony Road, which really, really put the real paper on the map, when you say, in terms of, you know, just a force to be reckoned with in the city. Um, it was serious, it was, it was big, that investigation. And tell me, did you feel any pressure at the time? I mean, you were involved in editing that, weren't you? Mm -mm. No. The Symphony Road, was it Symphony Road? The, uh, yeah. The, what, what year was it? 77. Yeah, that's after me. Yeah. Paul was, was not involved in that. And they didn't put the paper on, on the map. I think, you know, the paper was on the map from the beginning because of the quality of the voices in it and the, you know, the enormous generation gap uh, in that time that it was, you know, a voice of a set of people who really did not identify with the voices in the daily newspapers. Uh, and because of, you know, stories that uh, Paul solicited and edited about uh, the uh, declining Kevin White administration and stuff like that, I, you know, I don't think that uh, you are saying Those were great stories, the declining Kevin White administration. Yeah, so, you know, it's, you know, Every, every mayor after a certain amount of time goes crazy in Boston. And, and <laughs> but you gotta remember, I mean, that was the period, that was the period during which, you, if you turn on the nightly news, it would be Walter Cronkite, and Walter Cronkite would have over his, I can't remember which shoulder, but the Chiron, over his shoulder, and it would be the flags, this is during the Vietnam War, and it would be the flags of the different, the three combatants, the South Vietnamese Army, the, uh, the United States and the North Vietnamese, and there would be numbers, you may remember, casualty numbers, saying how many people died each week, and he would report this as if it were a fact. Uh, and by the time, if you just tallied up all the North Vietnamese, there was nobody left in the country. They, had, you know, <laughs> our numbers were so preposterous. And there, were, there was a big story, I remember, in the New York Times, right around this period, this was 72 or something, saying how false these numbers were. And yet every night or week, whatever the uh, time period was, the CBS would, put this out there, that was the, that's the gap Mark's talking about. So we say, no, no, that can't possibly be. Of course, as Laura points out, we're, we have Howard Zinn reporting on <laughs> the Vietnam. You know, so it wasn't exactly even handed. Uh, so, but, but we were the counterweight. And, uh, and we had, with our audience, certainly more credibility. And we had a substantial amount of completely legitimate credibility because we were saying things that were disruptive and that the straight media wouldn't say or wouldn't cover or just uh, you know wouldn't accept. And so anyway, just to amplify what Mark was saying. I do remember the Kevin White administration came under a lot of heat. A lot of stories we did on. Yeah, no, that was that was after the collective. That's that right. was in seven, 75. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, we, we did invest it. Well, that was the other thing. You, were, you weren't constrained by uh, cronyistic relationships with your sources, because you didn't have it. Right. I mean, you had sources, but you didn't, have, you didn't have any of the sources in the straight world, basically. So uh, I, I remember I, I wrote a piece about uh, uh, Boston Celtics last week uh, as a member of the Celtics. He went to the American Basketball Association. I wasn't a sports writer, so I hung out with the Celtics for a couple of weeks, and I could tell what I could report, this is after I was ed editor, what it was like, you know, to be with the team. No normal sports writer could ever do that. I mean, you could even say it was a hit and run job on my part, because I wasn't going back there. But A, you were allowed to use words like fuck or whatever in the paper, you know, sort of HBO of its time, if you will. Uh, <laughs> And so you could, there was a, a, you know, a veracity to it that, that wasn't out there in the other media. And then you didn't have the relationships with these people, so you didn't have to worry about uh, your sources and cultivating them and keeping them. Uh, and so there was. And you also weren't worried about your own stature in the community. I mean, yes, you wanted to be correct, but you didn't worry about, you didn't feel the pressure of oh my God, now I want to really, you know, now I want to jump to the New York Times and I want to do this and I want to do that. You were just, the real paper I thought at that time was it. It was the counter culture. It was the, exactly. I'm going to really open this uh, question for me to the late Andrew 
cop time because he had worked, you know, for for uh, Time Life, and he had worked for the New York Review of Books, and he had covered, you know, uh, Vietnam, and you know, he was somebody I just, you know, looked up up to as part of the establishment. But he was delighted to be working in the weeklies first at, at Boston After Dark, and then at the Real Paper. Uh, as a columnist, because it was where he felt he belonged, and the great lesson, one of the many lessons that you know I, I took from that was that it really didn't matter where you were, or what you were paid, or what people thought. If you were doing the work that you were supposed to do, you should be happy about that. The, one of the ways that we abused our freedom was that we actually muckraked our own side, and I think this was very important that we were willing to stay when somebody who was nominally on our side was part of the counterculture or part of the left or part of uh, you know our generation was screwed up, we would go after them. Um, and it's really one of the hallmark moments after the, uh, the staff owned paper was um, when a quasi-political bunch of bank robbers put a bomb in the Suffolk County Courthouse and they, you know, and they, phoned us where their note was explaining their political reasons. And we had a considerable internal argument about this, but in fact decided that we were not in favor of terrorism, even in 1976, and that uh, we would convey the information first to the FBI, <laughs> rather than write an exclusive story, uh, that this was our duty to, to society, and that we would avoid uh, you know, it, it becoming their political messenger uh, because of this act that we didn't approve of. Uh, you know, we did run a story about prison conditions, which was what they were being uh, bank robbers more than really political, but most interested in. Uh, and I think Paul may have written that story. I, I, I don't recall exactly. But, you know, that, that was an important decision, I think, uh, you know, that had to be taken among a number of people who thought, you know, hey, we've got this exclusive, let's run with it, or you know, maybe we should be on their side, but you know, almost everybody, including you know, people who have very wild and crazy reputations, even now said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, these people are not really part of us. <laughs> Harper, I'd like to ask you about relating the real paper to today. Does that sort of freedom, that sort of journalistic freedom, that sort of conscience exist today that you can see in any form in journalism? Well, well. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the expansive question, but I, I'm interested in that. Where, where, do, where do you go today? Salon? I think, yeah, I mean, there's elements of it on the, on the internet. There, there definitely are elements on the internet. I, I tell you, though, I. This is probably a sign of getting old, but my, the, a lot of the stuff that I remember from the early Phoenix and the real paper, the, the only place I think you find anything like it these days is the New Yorker. And I guess that means I have gotten really middle of the road. I don't know. Uh, but uh, there is the sort of, uh, obviously, Andy Kopkind would not, would not appear in the New Yorker. And I was being somewhat facetious. The, uh, I mean, you can you can find anything you want on the on the on the internet. I don't know of any place where this sort of material is all gathered together, and part of the reason is that at that time there was a cohesive culture, as Paul says, a counterculture. There was something. There were, it was, there were baby boomers and and people like Howard Zinn and, and Chomsky and so forth that were were older, but. But identified with the with the new left, and and uh, there was a musical uh, a, a tie-in musically that went through the whole culture, and and it just was was much more. There was much more of a, of an identifiable counterculture there, so that that uh, a review of so that I, I remember a picture Jeff, a picture Jeff Albertson took that. That that uh, this was actually for the Phoenix, but not the real paper. But it was, a, but Jeff was the photographer. Did did a lot of photography for the real paper, and it was a picture uh, from New York, uh, a radio and a radio and a television studio, a radio studio, of Chuck Berry and John Lennon doing a duck walk together, both with guitars. And I thought, 
that's it. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of it in, in a way. And I don't think that a picture of Bruce Springsteen or Fitz of the Tremors or anybody now with some old rocker would, would does that make any sense? I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with this, but I just, I think there was a, there was a real identifiable culture, and I, I think the culture is trifurcated, quadrificated, <laughs> multiplicated now, so. Oh, were you an editor or a writer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I just want to say one thing. When I went to work for the real paper, we were located in a house at 10B Mount Auburn Street in Cambridge. It was the best office ever. It was a house that was gerrymandered in two rooms and we all sat in there. Uh, I see the room right now. I see Betsy Meyer sitting there in, you know, at the reception desk. It was not a reception desk. I see me doing listings. I see Bert Solomon, who was a writer for the paper, on the phone constantly. I see Ed Zuckerman on the phone constantly. I see a little dog named Teeter, who was a, um, a sheepdog who was the smartest dog I've ever known in my life. And I didn't even <coughs> like dogs then, but I love this dog, Peter, who would come in and out at will. He was nominally Bert Solomon's. It was a wonderful office where you never knew who was gonna walk up the stairs. And it was just close and warm and great. And that's one memory I have of the real paper that I'll never, ever forget the office. I loved it. Well, Tina was probably like the rest of us. Where else was he going to work? Yeah, really. <laughs> he had really had a job. And every day he had to go out into Cambridge and round up some people and bring them back. No, no, I mean, it's, but that's, that's the point. There, what, we were part of this counterculture, and there, we didn't really have other places that were going to invite us in. No, no the, yeah, the big, as Harper was saying, the big difference then was there was really an us and a them, and it was just totally clear. The straight press was so straight, and they, uh, you know, it's, journalism, journalism really has changed. In those days, there was a way to write every story, and the paper just, it was a little more sophisticated in the Times, maybe a little dumber in the Globe, but it was the same way to look at something and create the same package. And we just wouldn't have anything to do with that. It was really a writer's paper, and an ed the editors were like the writers. And we could, uh, one of my favorite pieces that we all worked on was a series of short profiles of members of the uh, state legislature called the, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And <laughs> it was, it was great, it was, it was what you said. It was, we, we didn't, they weren't our sources, they weren't, we had no ties to these people. They were just, some of them real idiots who were, you know, our, both our elected officials and others were good guys and, and we talked and we just, Put them out there like that. In those days, you never would have seen something like that somewhere else. Today, there are 190 places, and you're, you haven't even left your computer where you where you'd see something. So it was great to be. It was great to be us. It was great to be doing it. And us was everybody. Us was everybody who read us. Us was, you know, what back Bay to Somerville. It was us. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite the audience to ask questions now, uh, if you have them. And uh, please come up to the microphones and ask your question at the microphone. There was, by the way, there was a, a past participle that we used, which was to be globed. And there was, I remember Joe Paletti, who had come from the Village Voice, edited the Phoenix before you, and then went to work at the Globe. And I remember Arnie Reisman saying, the first time I heard it, oh, he's been globed. And that's, <laughs> that's what you're talking about. And whatever happened to Joe Paletti. Right, right, straight jacket. Can you, any or all of you, say something about what caused the ultimate uh, demise of the real paper? You're the biggest guy. Go ahead. There are two stages to that. One is the first five or so years as a collective. And then I was not there after that, so I don't want to speak to this. It seemed like five years. It was two and a half. <laughs> 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 We had set it up so that we owned equal amounts, and the rule was if you left the paper, 
you had to turn in your stock and we paid you the book value. And this all looked very neat and it was all legal and nicely written down. But over the years, as we actually succeeded, which was a shock to most of us, it became apparent that if the paper were sold, the shares would be worth more than they were on the books. And it seemed to me that there's almost a necessary progression because anyone who wants to leave is going to say, well, why should I leave? I'll wait and we'll vote to sell the paper and I'll get some money for my shares, not these paltry few hundred dollars, but a few thousand. And eventually that, in a way that, I mean, there were other stresses and strains, God knows, but in some ways I think it was just the march of history. People got older and more experienced. Some people wanted to go to New York, take other jobs. They didn't, you know, you could only be a stockholder if you worked there. So that was what, how we agreed to sell it as a collective, to sell it to the group that David Rockefeller was part of. So, and after that, we weren't there. So I think the people who were there could talk about the later years. It was an enormous strain. The other, the other thing is that, is that it's very, very hard to run an, a, a, an organization like this. I mean, to be part of it, I don't mean to, you know, be at the top of it, the bottom of it, just to be part of it, where there's, where you all really have to get along. It's a very individualistic group of people, obviously, writers, and even the people who weren't writers were really writers, it turned out. And so it was just a very, very difficult thing to do. And all cooperatives run into this problem at some time or another. And we were really unprepared for that, I think. We didn't, uh, I've always thought that one of the most important things was that we didn't hire people on the basis of how likely they were to get along with the group. And so we had hired some people who were really, um, well, uh, no, I, I don't want to say anything. They were not people who were on my side, so I don't want to say anything in video I mean, about them. The real paper should have been a co-op board, letting some well, people some, in and some we people just didn't have, Yeah, maybe. We just didn't have real mechanisms for it. At any rate, those strains also tore, tore at us, and I think contributed to terrorist support. But then now why the paper ends is something else. Yeah, on the off chance that the question was why did it why did it really end at, yeah, you know right. under under ownership okay. in 1981, um, the answer was that we gra we had been gradually outcompeted on the business side by the Phoenix, um, and certainly you know their editorial held up um, as well. I, you know, as someone who read each paper intently each week, I you know could tell you a thousand reasons I thought ours was better, but. And, and as the editor at the end, I, you know, I, I mean quite literally, but uh, in general, they just got bigger and then there was a recession in one of the periodic collapses in the home electronics business, which was one of our two largest advertisers, beer being the other. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if you remember Quadraphonic didn't sell, you know, every so often in the home electronics business, we'd come up with the next new thing and it wouldn't sell. So it was one of these recessions in 1980, 81, and that just took enough air out of the possible advertising that the paper was losing more money than the owners were willing to lose for the privilege of being denounced by their own staff. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add that by then we had moved from that wonderful little place on Mount Auburn to a high rise uh, building on Mass Ave. 929, Massachusetts. 929 Mass Ave. I think they turned our old office back into apartments to make more money. Well, the, the tarp, if you want to t tell what we were talking about at lunch with regard to the baby boom and... and well, I, 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 God knows I don't know. <laughs> okay. No, uh, <laughs> I, I think that, that what was, well, one of the things that was happening with the baby boomers... Mike, 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 Mike. Mike. Uh, one of the things that was happening was the baby boomers were getting older and the culture that I had talked about was beginning to fragment. But, but I think, Paul, you pretty much convinced me at lunch today, I do remember, that the, that probably, that one paper did, did succeed. I mean, there is still a weekly newspaper in, in Boston. It succeeded splendidly, We have yeah. the editor of the Boston Phoenix in the audience. <laughs> and the Boston Phoenix won. I mean, I think that, that they had better, they had better people on the business side, I think, but, but I'm not sure about that. I, I better add salesmen.
Well, there was a 15-year window with you start with the, the Phoenix, the, the Cambridge Phoenix, Phoenix Polo, what you will, in 1981. That starts in the late 60s, and then in 81, the paper dies. And that's a period of time roughly equivalent to when the baby boom moved through. I mean, so there's at least a right. something. Yes. Don't you think uh, that geographically you were in the right place? In other, in other words, there aren't many Cambridges around. <laughs> Although, interestingly enough, there are uh, weekly papers in quite a, quite a few cities. But uh, uh, and you'd think Berkeley, California, if Cambridge was a good place, you'd think Berkeley, California, would be a good place. And, and there's the San Francisco Bay Guardian is something else, but Berkeley know? never produced a, a decent paper. Uh, so I don't know. That that was certainly Cambridge. Paul Sullivan, I don't think that Cronkite was running a weekly death count that included the communists. There's no way to have gotten a, anything remotely resembling an accurate count on the North deaths. Uh, he did run an American death count on a weekly basis. No, he had, he had, he had the North Vietnamese stuff there. My point is that, of course, it was inaccurate. It was, it was well, made I, up. It, was, it came from, well, that's the way I remember it. So I guess we can I don't think so at all. I want to ask you this, though. Can, was there a sense of the paper that you guys were pulling for our enemies? and against us, if not openly, then covertly. And on, uh, an additional kind of a linking point, uh, in 77, Sidney Blumenthal had a piece ripping Avi Nelson before he ran for the Senate. Uh, he was a radio talk show host at the time, and uh, Sidney ripped into him for daring to go to South Korea and, and the connections between who paid for the trip and the South Koreans are referred to as a dictatorship in the peace. He never laid a glove on the North Koreans, and they're much, much, much worse and more brutal dictatorship. Uh, so I want to ask you, how, how does that look in retrospect? Was Avi on the side of the bad guys back then or the good guys? I, I think we could take a vote on Avi Nelson and come up with no votes. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, Avi Nelson's just not, I don't Thank think he's you. in any of our, our, our uh, ken. Or, but I do think, I mean, there, there is a point with regard to, in 1972, we and the Phoenix joined together and did a uh, c joint cover. It was the same cover on both papers. It was called uh, uh, Peace on Earth, Victory of the Vietnamese, uh, by which we meant the North Vietnamese. Now, in retrospect, was that a, it, it was certainly partisan. It was trying to be a counterweight. Would I say, in retrospect, knowing what I know now, that that was, uh, legitimately partisan, that we weren't, uh, no, I wouldn't say, I would say that we were sort of falling for what we believed in at the time. Yes. Question you was that our government had lied, and mis lied to and misled us on the nature of the war in Vietnam. What we did not know until later was that the uh, Vietnamese Communist Party also was misleading uh, the people who fought on their side. And that doesn't undo what our government did in the 60s and 70s, in my view. Basically, we were intervening in a war between two dictatorships. And that would not seem like a smart thing to do. That was my position. Mm -hmm. Yes, do you have Hi. a question? Yes, um, I've heard various stories through the years about why the real paper was not able to continue as a collective. Uh, you mentioned the selling of the paper, I think it was in 1974, to, uh, to David Rockefeller. And all the paper did continue for several more years. And some great stuff was in the real paper after 1975. The, uh, the idea of, of it being a, a collective, I think, was a very romantic and a very positive thing because here were a bunch of people who walked the walk, as it were, who uh, believed in their ideals and were willing to put themselves on the line for it. Uh, and as so far as I know, and you guys are the experts, the paper from 72 to 74 did make money. It wasn't a money loser. It was a financial success. So uh, with that as a backdrop, why in, in your view, collectively, no pun intended, uh, did, uh, was it necessary to, if it was necessary, to sell the paper off to a private interest who just happened to be a Rockefeller, uh, and why it couldn't have gone on with the, sp the spirit of 72, as it were, uh, beyond 1974. 
Paul, you want to take that? No, I have talked about this. I think actually I was addressing that earlier when I said there was this natural pressure once we were a success. The shares that might have been worth $2,000 if you turned them back in. And Howard Garsh could actually explain this perfectly well. So I'll just, so, so I'll let him. Howard, can, if you want to talk, he, 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 he was the controller. controller. So he yeah. could tell and you. And on what. the board of directors. Right. And um, uh, your point about the fact that we all realize that our shares could not possibly be worth, uh, just, just on the book basis, as much as the goodwill that the company was actually building up. Um, that was certainly a part, and uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about that. But what I would want to mention, very directly in answer to you, is um, I remember the salary committee meeting at my apartment in Cambridge once, and we were trying to set the salaries for the next year. And um, a, uh, the receptionist was there, and it wasn't Betsy, it was someone else. Betsy was in the editorial department. And um, she was the, one of the members uh, of the staff who was there. And um, we were looking to decide, trying to decide how much Bob Rotner, who was the publisher, should be getting. At the time, I believe, he was getting 250. And um, we were looking to give him a salary increase up to something like $300 a week. And the receptionist was getting 175 a week at this time. And, um, and she couldn't understand and no one could explain to her why it is that the publisher, with all those awesome responsibilities a publisher has, how could anybody be worth more than twice what she is worth, no matter what the work is that he does. And, um, and then when we got down to discussing the controllers, um, uh, salary. The fact that we were sitting on what looked to be a fairly new couch <laughs> was, <laughs> was literally mentioned by this young woman as um, proof positive of the fact that I should have held in need an ink. <laughs> um, so, and then somebody alluded to the fact that there were a, a, a number of intramarital affairs going on at the time. And some of them were fairly high up in the organization. And it got to the point where literally staff were having to be on the side of the publisher or the associate publisher, the editor, or you know, one person or another. And, and we got <laughs> I don't want to be out of that. Yeah, I'm not the editor, but various people. And it got to the point where um, board meeting, I mean, uh, stockholders meetings, of which I took the minutes and I, I could probably sell them for quite a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> it got ridiculous. There was so much personal stuff going on that um, we realized that this was a wonderful cooperative idea. Each one of us had the same power. The publisher had his 100 shares and the receptionist had her 100 shares and it just didn't make any sense. And um, I thought, we thought this would be a good time to sell out. And the one last thing and point I want to make is this, the beauty, the, 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 the great joy that every one of us had was that Richard uh, Misner sold the Phoenix to Stephen Lindich once when he sold us out. And I don't know how much exactly we paid for that. It took another 10 or 11 years before Rockef well, Rockefeller dropped out of it. It's, no, no, Well dropped out. Uh, well, the, uh, the uh, governor was right. one of the owners. But it was 11 years later when uh, Stephen Lindich had to pay all over again to put the real paper finally <laughs> out of business. And that gave us all a great deal of joy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Yes, you have a question? Monica, Steve Crosby. I was the oh, uh, assistant Crosby, to the publisher. Uh, 1976. My question, Monica, is just why do you think so many people sent their parents to this event? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, 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 Susan Garsh, Howard's wife, Judge Garsh, expl explained this to me. I said, well, okay, I see all these people from the real paper who are here, but who are all the other people? She said, they were all hawkers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, uh, I'm Harvey Silverblade, and I wrote a column oh, for Harvey, Brief yes, Cases. Real paper headliner. Yeah, it was about judges and the fools they were and court cases and unfair uh, outcomes and police brutality and all of that stuff. And uh, I have a general question of the panelists. Uh, and the, the question is, do you, what impact do you think the writing in the real paper had on what's called the establishment, uh, the real world? Uh, uh, did it have any impact or was it just of interest to the counterculture community? The reason I ask the question is, you know, I wrote the, I wrote the, uh, the legal column. Uh, I still do, in fact. I'm the oldest living uh, columnist still at the Boston Phoenix, and I'm maybe second oldest. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what I discovered when I was at the real paper was that the, my columns and the issues of the paper found their way into judges' lobbies all over the Commonwealth. And people would tell me, lawyers would tell me, court officers would tell me on the slides. Remember, I litigated cases, I was in the courts. Uh, that the judges were really concerned with what I said about them, what the paper said about them. And they would read it avidly to see if their name was mentioned in the uh, in the legal column. I was astonished by this, uh, but I found it very interesting and still do. So I'm interested in knowing what impact in the, out in the establishment in the real world you think the paper had at the time. I'll just throw in my two cents. I think the real paper was beautifully edited, incredibly well written. There, were, there was a great mix of stories, stories about outlandish things, pedestrian things, unexpected things. I think it was a great read. No wonder it ended up in everyone's, everyone read the real paper, I thought, and it had a great reach. But why don't you, Laura, and you, Mark, talk about the, the impact of the stories that were in the paper. I think that, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that the, that the real impact was more that, um, I think journalism started to change in our years, it wasn't just the real paper, but the real paper and the Globe, it made a very vivid example. The Globe changed because of the real paper. And then when those of us who left the paper and went on out into places like Newsweek and the press and, and other, other major, bigger news organizations, we were still ourselves. We didn't stop writing for the real paper just because we weren't writing for the real paper. That certainly was my experience. And those things helped to change journalism. So that's what I would say is that the, the, the big long range impact that was that we were, we were part of something that, uh, that, that really made a big difference in American journalism. Um, on the particular of judges, it's interesting because in the early, early days of, of the papers, day, judges, uh, corrupt judges were often one of our issues. When I was on Boston after dark, Judge Troy in Dorchester, who used to offer, uh, you know, young people accused of crimes, a choice of going to jail for two years or going down to the Army recruiter office and going to Vietnam, was one of our favorite subjects. He had engaged in land speculations and um, deals. And, you know, I remember being assigned to spend a day in the court of Judge Adlon of the Boston Municipal Court, who used to just basically yell at defendants. Uh, and berate them and you know, bind, you change their charges and bind them over on status offenses, uh, which were you know, later found to be illegal and uh, removed. So uh, we, had, we had a long history with judges and landlords. And, you know, they were certain prime targets at the, the time. Um, and, and I'm sure they read the paper because uh, they were tended to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> We had some success with, I mean, we got rid of the sheriff of Suffolk County. Oh, right, I remember We got rid of, yes, we, had, I, <laughs> we, we had, yeah, it, certainly an impact, I think, negative impact on Kevin White's political career, for <coughs> better or worse, but certainly, and, and there were numerous examples of targeted stories which did have some actual political impact, Harvey, and so I think, you know, because other people weren't doing it. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, uh, first of all, I guess um, I'm a current staff writer at the Phoenix, so I just like to thank everybody who, like, I was only born in 1979, so <laughs> <laughs> for everybody who did, you know. Did, did we have anything to do with that? I just, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
I've, I've read through a lot of uh, a lot of old real papers, a lot of old phoenixes, a lot of big junkie for that kind of stuff. And I've I've heard uh, a lot of the stories about you know just the competition. I heard uh, one. It might have been in Jerry's movie about uh, the real paper sending someone to New York to review Manhattan to get it in before the Phoenix or just something like that. So I was wondering if you could all comment about just kind of the competition and how how that was really what kept the two papers going and and how you wouldn't have been able to do it without the other one. That kind of stuff. If that's true, and, and if there are any specific stories about. I don't know, spats or stuff like that. Were you aware of the competition? I wasn't. I, I, was, I just thought we were sui generis. You know, we were just ourselves. Well, I came from the, I had worked for Boston after dark, so I, I was certainly aware of it. That's what Mark did. I did Mark for hire. But were you aware of what they did week to week? Were you oh, sure. Aware of the two? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, I mean, look, they, it wasn't like there was this vast difference between the two. I mean, you know, yeah, sorry, Lori. We were way better. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you call that a vast difference, then I suppose. <laughs> the big, uh, the time when I think we were all aware that there were two papers was when Mindich bought the paper, and we were struggling to become the real paper, and there was a drawn-out court case about the use of the name and a little incident where somebody seems to have uh, stolen some of the, uh, the, the flats for the, for the next issue that were stolen and, and of course they were returned very quickly. Anyway, there was a lot going on in court. And uh, it was, that, that was kind of wonderful. And, and the, um, uh, the difference between the two of us, and they were like the big, you know, mid like this whole big, they were the establishment. They were the counterculture establishment. <laughs> and they were the other ones. <laughs> That was like a little mini version of us versus them. So he made a wonderful enemy. It was great, and uh, you know, that, I mean, the globe was always there to be to be the to be the other. But to have Mindich be the other was a lot of fun. So that's when I think it became very lively that moment. Yes, you have a question. Uh, no, I thought I'd probably answer some questions. I was the managing editor of the Phoenix from 1973 to 1980. Oh, please identify yourself. Uh, David Moran. I and, did. Um, and I never thought I would. I knew there would be shots about Mendes, but he needs no defending, and I would certainly not stand up to defend him. Uh, we were intensely aware and friendly with most of the people, with all of the people, the real paper. Uh, the only troubles we ever felt was when was seeing them either slump or fail or go through struggles. We could all count ad pages. We could all compute ad densities. We all had the same kinds of coverage. We just had an enormous amount more space. I don't know that it was because of ad salesmen, but we had huge audio supplements. I had a lot to do with that. We had a lot of audio writers who went on to New York to become famous audio writers. Like the real paper, we had film critics and uh, you know political people like Paul. My first job after leaving the Phoenix in 1980 was to go work for the War Commission. The War Commission and the entire MBM thing was almost completely a Phoenix and Dick Gaines enterprise. Not different from the kind of stuff the real paper did, very similar. But it was nobody at the Phoenix wished the real paper ill or any of the people there and were very, uh, I don't think we were that surprised when it finally folded it, and I wasn't there anymore, but um, it, the slumping in the late 70s and as people left. The other reason we were worried is that when people left it meant they would come to the Phoenix where we already had plenty of staff. We had more film critics and more audio people and more political people and more Kevin White bashers and more <laughs> judge bashers and more uh, symphony uh, road uh, arson investigators that we knew what to do with. Um, so it was just to sit there and kind of watch the real paper struggle was for me very, very troubling. But the, but whatever else you say about Mendes, we, we hired more, had more space, paid more. I made $500 a year more than Tom Friedman, which I can assure you was the last time. <laughs> that never happened. But that's just part of being, the, I mean, you know, you can be pious and sort of holier than thou, that's fine. I, I'm not defending a businessman. 35 years later, I can tell you, I've had so many worse bosses in the private sector than Stephen Mind. I mean, I mean, fools and knaves and sociopaths, and I mean, <laughs> the Phoenix years and the real paper, friends of mine years, it all looks fairly mature, and as Paul said, I mean, extremely sophisticated writing. Always too long. <laughs> always windy, always wordy. I was the first, as Ken Emerson said, the first real copy editor, in addition to being managing editor at the Phoenix. And I was an English teacher before that. And uh, I came there. And, and the other big difference was um, that uh, kind of by accident, the uh, Phoenix hired 
And I and the it didn't you know the milk paper was so good that this was not a major coup. But they hired a full time blow guy in 1973 who hired me, and he had been a an ME an assistant ME at the Globe, and for the next. I guess he left in 79, but for the next six years, he gave it, and his interest in the arts and in the uh, feminism and the counterculture was, you know, 50-50, but his interest in hard politics was intense. So Bill Miller had a lot to do with the growth of the first section, and the rest of it, we were all kind of competing for the same dollars. We, we had the Ben Sack, we had the Sack Theater account. That yeah. probably alone right Sack there. Theaters, I remember that. that yeah, was I mean, big somebody big was saying about, I mean, Mark was saying, you know, more better ass sales, but maybe I want to get another don't. question in, but anyway. thank you so much. So the success was self evident and, you know, nothing to gloat about. Thank you. Yes. Um, let, let me make a comment. I took over women's notes from Laura and some of you probably don't remember me because my hair is a different color. Could you identify yourself? My hair is, my hair was dark, my hair is white now, my name is Ellen Cantaro. Oh, Ellen oh. Cantaro, how are you? Ellen I'm Cantaro, I'm, well, I'm okay, I'm getting a little older. <laughs> um, but I came to the real paper in the latter, um, in, in its, in its later life. And I would like to say just a couple of things about how the spirit that you guys have described of the original version carried over to the time when I was there. First of all, many, many people's careers, Laura's, yours, yours, Mark's, yours, Jan, were yours, Monica, were launched by the real paper. And mine in a kind of mini fashion. I mean, I didn't go on to the mainstream media, but I went on to write for the, I went on to write in the counterculture. I went on to write for the voice, Mother Jones. I still write in the counterculture. I write online for Tom Dispatch and for other publications there. And I learned I was trained how to write journalistically when I was at the real paper. I came from academia, unlike some of you, and um, I, I had an editor named Russ Hoyle, whose name has not been mentioned. Um, <laughs> and there were, there were many feelings about Russ, but I remember Russ told me, you think you can write, you can't. And I was really pissed at him, but I really learned how to write. The other thing has to do with editorial freedom. And now I'm going to introduce a more serious note. It didn't have to do with using words like uh, fuck or cunt. I, Marty Linsky, who was a Zionist and who was not in the audience, um, sent me to Israel to write about nothing less than women in Israel. So that was a big topic. And I took on assignments for several other venues. One was an article about the settler movement in the West Bank for the Village Voice, and the other was an article about a village that was besieged by settlers for another venue. And Marty hoped that I would become converted to his point of view. And I came back and I was writing stuff that is not popular either in the mainstream press and that was not popular in the counterculture either. And he allowed every word to remain. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna get a couple more questions in before we, we're hitting the time wall here. Okay. But thank you for that, Ellen. Okay. Yes. Hi, um, you've talked a lot about uh, us and them, counterculture press and mainstream press, and many of you have gone on to successful careers in the mainstream slash straight press, and there's even a tie on the panel, um, which kind of offsets the mask. <coughs> Could you talk about what that transition was like personally and professionally? 
Who wants to tackle that? You, you went straight for it. Well, he came very quickly. I started out with the, in, in the straight for it. I started out with the St. Louis Post Dispatch uh, from 65 to 70. And, and uh, but I was the rock, I was the rock critic. And, and that's not, I don't know that my experiences were, well, I, I remember <coughs> chafing. Uh, and some of the restrictions on the, on the writing. And so when the offer came to come edit the Phoenix, I was really, uh, I was glad. And the freedom I had at, at the Phoenix and at the real paper, uh, that I, after I'd gone back to the daily newspaper, the Post-Dispatch, the, the freedom, I, it took me a while to get over it. Uh, but I think what I, ultimately ended up doing, and I think what Laura did, and I, uh, I think uh, other people who went to more establishment media did, was bringing some of the spirit of, of the alternative press to, to, the, to the, I mean, look at the, I look at the papers like, the daily papers like the Boston Globe and, and the New York Times, and New York Times particularly, it's written, it's almost as well written as the real paper was. You know? <laughs> and, I think that's because people are coming. I think it's. I think the influence of the alternative press, the real paper, the Phoenix, the Village Voice, uh, uh, in particular, uh, has been has. It's, it's, it's always happens. I think uh, a generation grows up and and becomes more, you know, but it takes over the the, the establishment. So I think uh, I think probably the. the that's, that, that's what I wanted to say. Thank yeah. you very much. You know what I would like to do right now? I would like, starting over here, I would like everyone who wrote for the real paper to stand up. And I'd like us to go around the room because we're running out of time. associated in whatever way with the real paper to stand up and let's start over here and let's shout out your names. Wendell Smith. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> Time for the last two questions, or should we should we wrap up? Well, I wanted to get on the but our style today didn't hear a chance for even to say less than this was offended. Thank you all for letting me ask a question. Uh, I, I regret that I was not around when the paper uh, was in existence. Uh, I was a child of the 80s, so unfortunately I missed the good writing of journalism. Uh, so my question is about unfortunate. how old you'd be now. <laughs> so my question is about writing and journalism, because although I'm not a journalist myself, I didn't go to communication school, um, and I'm wondering about the real paper's journalistic philosophy. To what extent, to what extent was objectivity important? Was it, and to what extent is objectivity and journalism necessary? helpful even, and, and I don't need to make this question too long, but what's the difference between good journalistic writing and good advocacy writing? And what was the real paper actually doing? Uh, 
I think the, 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 uh, I think the personalities of the writers came through in the paper, in the stories in the real paper. So in that sense, the, the articles were not always advocacy journalism. Uh, I, I think what you ought, what you should do with with advocacy journalism when, when you do it is try to be fair. Uh, and uh, but but the idea of, of on the one hand, on the other hand, back and forth uh, uh, is not necessary. I also think that if you're going to have an alternative press, you need a mainstream press to play off of. And uh, I think we were lucky uh, in that there was, this, this was the Vietnam era, the era of Watergate, the era of, of, uh, uh, of the Pentagon Papers and so forth. I think there were some good, damn good daily papers going on too, but we we, we explained what they what they what they couldn't, I guess. I personally, to this day, strive for rigorous objectivity, <laughs> so I definitely take that very seriously. But uh, on the rare occasions when I slip over the line. <laughs> I remember that I learned it at the real paper. <laughs> <laughs> Jacks <laughs> and have a beer. And we sat down at Jacks, and Harper said, um, uh, I, Wendell, uh, I've been told to fire you. Explain what you did, Wendell. I mean, just what, not what you did to occasion the firing. Well, well I, I would do things like I would do things like stand up in the president in the presence of the vice president of the United States on national television. And this this this, this <clears throat> eroded the paper's credibility with the business community. <laughs> but, but explain what you did for the paper. I mean, that's, I just oh, people don't oh, I wrote a I wrote a column that was called a graffiti, and uh, and I uh, uh, the I I went to uh, I was uh, hitchhiked around the country and ended up in Wounded Knee in 1973. Um, <laughs> went back in Wounded Knee and was ar arrested by the federal marshals there um, that April. Um, got shot at by some cluxers in Georgia on a piece um, for Harper. And, but, uh, <laughs> but in, 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 and I read that I would run a list of political um, meetings and I had the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and the Communist Party and the Socialist Workers Party all in the same as if there was no difference between them. And I'm not sure that there is to this day. That wasn't the problem, Wendell. It's that the column was full of your poetry. <laughs> Sometimes in April, I cross the bridge 
between Cambridge and the back bay, and the faint odor catches up with me, and I can see with my being who remembers the Ice Age, two millions of wild water fowl come to rest and feed and fertilize on their migrations. And I ask the white man in me, what happens when the salt grass disappears, when the marshes we thought endless isn't? When the eastern flyway is scraped out of the sky by the tombstones of these cities, how then will my children inherit the souls of Canada geese? And where will I find the wings of a trumpeter swan to carry mine? Now, I, I used to think that that made... <laughs> when I was working for the real paper, I thought that meant my name was Trumpeter Swan. <laughs> I now think that my name is something more like Wachichuka Sahawe, which is to say, the white man who is too arrogant to walk. <laughs> so, uh, so Harper tried to fire me. And, 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 I remember the name of the owner, forget Richard. Richard. So, and I said, oh, okay, Harper. And I marched <laughs> back to the office, and I went into Richard's office, and I said, Richard, you can't fire me. <laughs> and Richard said, well, if I can't fire you, I'll fire everybody. <laughs> and that was what set off the strike. Whoa, really? Because wow. I told him he couldn't run the paper that he wanted to. He couldn't fire me. I wasn't going to get... I wasn't going to be tear gassed in Harvard Square while he was sitting in his office and taking the risks that were necessary to find out what was going on and be told by him that I couldn't do it anymore. And now you catch the spirit of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hear you say that. <laughs> and, and your firing me was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. And, and like any divorce, it took me a long time before I realized it. It's very sweet of you to say. You know, you all talk about, oh, I'm getting older. I'm exhausted. <laughs> In, in 103 years, the Ford Hall Forum has never had, has never seen such a group of exuberant, brilliant, baby booming hippies. No, we're a very rich group. <laughs> it's a very rich group here tonight. This has been an amazing experience for me. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And let me just tell you that the first star interview I ever did for The Real Paper was Martin Mull. I went to uh, Paul's Mall where I saw his performance and I wrote an interview with him. And at that performance, Martin Mull looked out into the audience and he said, I want to thank you all for coming. Or however you reacted. <laughs> and I remember Thank you everyone for coming or however you react.